have bypass reactions getting us um, backwards from pyruvate to phosphoenol pyruvate. We're going to have a backwards reaction, a, a separate, totally different reaction, getting us backwards from fructose 1,6-bisphosphate to fructose 6-phosphate. And finally, we talked a bit about this. There's a separate reaction going backwards from glucose 6-phosphate to glucose. Let's take a look then at the process of gluconeogenesis. Our first step of gluconeogenesis is the backwards two steps required to get from pyruvate to um, phosphoenol pyruvate. We know that phosphoenol pyruvate is the most powerful molecule we see in glycolysis, so obviously getting backwards to that is going to take an investment of a great deal of energy. So the very first thing that, that does occur is um, a reaction in which it's a highly complicated mechanism, in fact, um, in which the pyruvate is actually um, converted into oxaloacetate. It seems like that should be a very simple reaction, and in fact, it's one that you've seen before. Remember the carb flame? However, it actually takes quite a lot to um, get this carboxylation to take place. So recognize that the very first thing that takes place is that an ATP is carboxylated, and then that ATP actually, um, the carboxylated ATP is able to carboxylate a biotin cofactor. And then um, with the help of activation, it makes sense that acetyl-CoA would um, be an allosteric activator of pyruvate carboxylase because acetyl-CoA indicates that the TCA cycle has sort of slowed to a crawl and there's just been this traffic jam of acetyl-CoA starting to take place. Um, and so this is signaling the need for the production of oxaloacetate, which remember that that is the um, intermediate in the TCA cycle. And so making more of it will allow for the fill up or anaplerotic re reaction. Um, anaplerotic, anaplerotic is like a fill up um, reaction that gets the TCA cycle moving faster. But of course, in this case, the um, goal of our production of oxaloacetate is to enable us to go on to the next bypass reaction to um, get us from all the way from pyruvate to phosphoenol pyruvate. Um, so I should just mention that the very last step of this complicated reaction mechanism is, of course, after the activation of pyruvate carb carboxylase by acetyl-CoA, the um, complex of the biotin that's been carboxylated is now capable of, of transferring that, uh, that um, CO2 onto the um, pyruvate molecule to make oxaloacetate. So first bypass reaction done, but notice that already if we're talking per pyruvate, we've already, our bank account is dismal. We've already invested an ATP um, per every pyruvate, but of course we want to make glucose with these reactions. So it's essentially like we've already invested two ATPs per glucose. And the bypass is only halfway complete because the next reaction is that in which the oxaloacetate is converted into phosphoenol pyruvate, the very, very high energy molecule. This also requires the investment of an ATP equivalent in the form of GTP. The enzyme that catalyzes this step is extremely famous. It's called PEP carboxykinase. Let's make sure we completely balance our bank, bank account. So now we have another ATP equivalent in the form of GTP that is invested. And if we're considering this in terms of per glucose, it's two, the equivalent of two GTP per glucose. So essentially it's like we have an already invested the equivalent of four ATP um, at this point after only one 
um, bypass reaction to get us back just literally one step. Um, so let's talk about this famous enzyme, though, um, PEP part carboxykinase. Um, PP carboxykinase is not allosterically regulated the way that pyruvate carbox carboxylase is, but it is regulated at the level of the gene. So if you are undergoing prolonged starvation, that is to say, um, yes, Tyler, that your glucagon levels are very high for a very extended period of time, then at the level of the gene encoding for PEP carboxykinase, the gene will be um, upregulated um, gene expression is is increased if the concentration of glucagon is high for a very long period of time. Cool, let's talk PPCK. <laughs> It turns out that many of you who are athletes or you have a career uh, in an athletic field, you're going to be so interested to hear about this study. Um, it was done in 2007 and published in the Journal of Biological uh, chemistry, and we can see the title, Overexpression of the Cytosolic Form of Phosphoenolpyruvate Carboxykinase, that is PP carboxykinase, in skeletal muscle, repatterns energy metabolism in the mouse. And boy, does it ever. So what they did for this study was that they were able to create transgenic mice that overexpressed the PP carboxykinase enzyme. And they, they call them, uh, in this study, they call them the PEPCK superscript muscle mice. And these mighty mice are, are incredible. Um, look at, as compared to controls, some of the values that we see. So these mice on a treadmill ran up to six kilometers at speeds of 20 meters per minute. Compare this to the control that ran 0.2 kilometers. Check it out. Increased VO2 max. Increased um, ability to clear lactate. Um, they had... Uh, in enhanced uh, body composition. That is to say that they had half the body weight of those control mice. They had 10% the body fat of control mice. Holy cow, these really are mighty mice. And I don't know about you guys, but this scares me a little bit. When you think about the lengths to which ath elite athletes like to try to go in order to have these sort of gains, this is, Im I mean, almost, it is measurable, right? But the idea, it's incredibly, um, large effect of, uh, of overexpression of PEP carboxykinase. So think about it. This makes sense, doesn't it? Because PEP carboxykinase is making possible the conversion of non-carbohydrate precursors into carbohydrates, the creation of glucose. Crazy. Right, so we're looking for the first bypass reactions right here, um, taking pyruvate backwards to phosphoenol pyruvate right there. Now, as it turns out, the first enzyme, so this can't just occur in two steps in the cytosol, it actually has to occur beginning with the pyruvate in the mitochondrial matrix because the first enzyme, um, the pyruvate car carboxylase, is only present within the mitochondrial matrix. So the first bypass reaction is the conversion of pyruvate to oxaloacetate in the mitochondrial matrix. Now that sounds okay because then you're thinking, all right, well then the oxaloacetate just goes out here and then it's converted into phosphoenopyruvate and we're done. Um, I wish it were that simple um, because in fact it turns out this pesky inner mitochondrial membrane is not permeable to oxaloacetate. So what will sometimes happen is that step two bypass will occur right here in the mitochondrial matrix. It depends upon the organism and it will get converted to phosphoenolpyruvate right here and then PEP can head out and it is of course present now um, as PEP and that bypass reaction has occurred. Sometimes this 
this enzyme is not present inside of the mitochondrial matrix, so oxaloacetate will be converted to something else, which will then be shipped out, which will then be converted to phosphoenopyruvate. But in any case, there are basically these two bypass reactions, getting pyruvate backwards to phosphoenopyruvate. Wow, what a pain it is to get past one metabolically irreversible step in glycolysis. So with the enzymes pyruvate carboxylase and PEP carboxykinase, we've managed to bypass pass this last step of glycolysis in a two-step process to get back to phosphoenopyruvate. And as we've kept track of our bank account count there, we've noted that there was an ATP invested here at this step. And then there was a GTP invested here at this step. Let's now trace the six steps between this step and the next metabolically irreversible step, knowing that all, all that happens there is simply the backwards or reverse reaction from what happened in glycolysis, because we recognize all of these steps as being near equilibrium steps. But don't forget that things were happening there in those steps. Remember that right here, 1,3-BPG had made an ATP. So ADP, and in fact there was two of those, right, for uh, every one glucose. So if we were maintaining the stoichiometry on there, we would maintain that there were two at that point that were created. Um, and then if we also look back here, uh, right at this step, we generated the NADHs, the two NADHs. So in the backwards reactions there, it looks like we're going to need to invest one ATP per every pyruvate, ter two per glucose, and likewise one NADH per every pyruvate, two per glucose will have to be invested here in order to get backwards along that step. So it looks like we can add to our tally an additional ATP and a reducing equivalent in the form of NADH.